I'm Gail Hadley, the Technical Director of the Vascular Ultrasound Core Lab at Mass General Hospital. This presentation is going to discuss how to conduct an upper extremity venous duplex scan. Upper extremity venous thrombosis is more common and less benign than previously thought. Originally, most patients were asymptomatic and there were no screening exams to look for upper extremity venous thrombosis. So actually the incidence is much higher than originally reported. Approximately 10 to 30 percent of upper extremity thrombus will cause PE. And this is from generally the central veins. The incidence of central vein thrombus is doubled in those patients who present with symptoms. So if you have a patient that comes to the laboratory and has symptoms for upper extremity central vein thrombosis, it is more than likely that the scan will be positive for some central vein problem. The relative risk, as just mentioned, pulmonary embolism, venous hypertension, and this is particularly a problem for those patients who have dialysis access grafts in their forearms. If you have a dialysis access graft and you have central vein thrombosis or occlusion, you could have the problem with this added burden of volume of flow into the central veins. They can't handle the volume and then it just goes into the tissues and the patient's arms become extremely swollen and actually is life altering for these patients. Then there's a huge problem with no access. If you've occluded your central veins and you depend on a fistula for, as your lifeline, then you have limited your options for further dialysis. So therefore, it's very important to be able to accurately identify the absence or presence of central vein thrombosis. Factors that contribute to the problem, central venous catheters. 70% of those patients with, set with central venous catheters can actually have central vein problems, stenosis or thrombosis. If you add malignancy to the patient that has a central vein catheter, the percentage actually goes up. Then those, those patients, usually younger males, that have physical functional impairment, and that's called Paget Schroeder. And what happens is at the thoracic inlet, where you have your veins, your arteries, your nerves, that during certain motions, the first rib will actually cause compression of some of these structures. And if they do some sort of occupation where they have repeated compression of the vein, it will set up an area for thrombus formation. And you see this a lot in athletes, baseball, people who continually are doing the same motion over and over and over again. IV drug abuse, radiation-induced, thrombosis, extrinsic compression, generally from masses that are found in the chest, and congestive heart failure. Symptoms include pain and swelling, dilated superficial veins, and these dilated superficial veins are generally seen anteriorly across the chest. Catheter problems related to dialysis, if it's on the ipsilateral side to the problem, the patient's dialysis might have some changes occurring because of the obstruction in the central veins. Peripheral thrombosis is generally a clinical diagnosis, and this is seen by a palpable cord. Usually it's red, it's warm, and this is often occurs from IVs. If you need to scan these patients, you would just scan the vein in question and follow to determine the specific location and extent. This presentation is going to focus on the upper extremity central veins. The equipment to conduct the scan includes a small footprint transducer. This is your best option because of all the bony structures, the clavicle and the shoulder. It is helpful if your footprint is very small so you can get into some of these smaller spaces and be able to manipulate your beam. Variable transducer frequencies are helpful. You're scanning anywhere from very superficial, looking at the IJ, down to the deeper depths of the innominate vein. Now, most often you will not need to change frequencies, but you should entertain this thought should the image quality fall off. Acoustic gel, it is good to keep sterile acoustic gel around. A lot of these patients with central venous catheters will have coverings and it's very, very important not to contaminate the catheter. And so sterile gel and or a tegaderm over the 
actual catheter site needs to be placed before you can conduct your scan. You need a recording device and as noted the sterile coverings. And here in the image you can see using a sternal notch approach which is reserved for maybe when you have dressings and can't see from the infraclavicular and supraclavicular approach but you can actually see both anominate veins joining to see the superior vena cava. This is unusual because the superior vena cava is rarely seen. Now the protocol to conduct the exam, you need to conduct a bilateral exam, you need to examine the internal jugular vein, subclavian vein, anominate, also known as the brachial cephalic veins, axillary vein, superficial veins, cephalic and basilic veins, and the peripheral veins are added when necessary. Now to identify the central veins correctly, you need to understand the anatomy and the spatial relationships to other vessels. And looking here at the anatomical image, we have the IJ as it comes down to the confluence of the anominate and the subclavian. Then we see the subclavian vein, the more central portion here, then we extend out to the peripheral portion, and this is where we run into the clavicle, and this portion of the vein cannot be visualized, and that is one of the limitations of upper extremity venous scanning, the inability to see all vessel segments. Then we come out to the axillary vein, and for this, because of the bony structures, again, here's your clavicle, you're going to use the infraclavicular approach to be able to access and get a clear image of the axillary veins. Due to the location of the axillary vein and the IJ, we are actually able to use compression maneuvers, where with the subclavian vein, compression maneuvers are not possible due to the clavicle. As we continue on down with the anatomy, we come out of the axilla, and then we have the cephalic vein, and we have the axillary vein confluence of the basilic vein. Now the cephalic and the basilic are your predominant veins of the upper extremity arm, even though they are superficial veins. This is unlike the lower extremities where the deep veins play the predominant role. Now there are numerous collateral pathways to the upper extremities and it's important to be aware of these pathways even if you don't understand or know the name of the vessel that the upper extremity in the presence of occlusions collateralizes very rapidly. And when this happens, these collateral pathways take over. And you can see the relationships in this diagram here. If this were occluded, the internal jugular vein, then your external jugular vein might take over and you might see some direction of flow changes, you might see some size changes, but most importantly is you're going to see a different relationship of this vein to the common carotid artery. So one should always suspect when the internal jugular vein is not seen a line next to the common carotid artery that they might in fact be next to one of the collateral vessels or the external jugular vein. Anatomic anomalies are rare in the upper extremities, unlike the lower extremities where you often have duplicated systems, absent vessels, uh, that is rarely seen in the upper extremities. Anatomical considerations, as I noted before, superior vena cava is very rarely visualized and you can indirectly make a diagnosis of superior vena cava syndrome if you see diminished flow from both anominates and or subclavian veins. The anominate vein complete visualization is limited and depends upon each individual's anatomy. The axilla subclavian veins are visualized only partially due to the interference of the clavicle. Multiple approaches required here, infraclavicular and supraclavicular, to try and actually get around the bony interference. You have limited compressibility due to the bones, and it's also prone to artifact from bone and lung. And here we actually have the left anominate vein. Here we have one of the referenced landmarks. It's the internal mammary, and you can see the pleura, again, something that will cause artifact during our scanning. The technique, the patient should always be placed supine. They should be comfortable. The exam is bilateral. You use both a supraclavicular and infraclavicular approach. Here we're looking at the axillary vein and we're assessing it. The clavicle runs this way. 
from the infraclavicular approach. You can also access the axillary vein by coming up through the axilla and aiming up towards the clavicle. This can be used to identify and get a second view of the axillary vein. Now, you should always do a brief clinical assessment for the patient. This can be very helpful in identifying where the problem might be. And in this particular patient, we can see that this patient has had previous indwelling catheters by the scarring here. So even if your patient can't give you a history, you should always assess the patient for any marks from previous lines. And there's also, it's difficult to see in this image, but you can look at the IJ here, there is definitely some prominence of the superficial veins. All of this is classic for a patient with central vein obstruction. If you look at the size of the arm, this is the normal referenced arm, and this arm appears, we have whole limb swelling, which is about twice the size of the contralateral asymptomatic arm. Now, in the lower extremity, compression maneuvers are most helpful and the number one primary method of diagnosing DVT. The image plays a secondary and complementary role and Doppler as well. While the upper extremity, compression is limited and not dependent upon for the diagnosis of thrombosis. So you need to employ several parameters. That includes your image, color Doppler, and spectral Doppler. Here we have a patient that meets all of the criteria for a positive study. Here's the wall of the, out here we have the axillary. Here is the most central portion of the subclavian vein. And here we can see the echoes consistent with thrombus. We have a narrowed lumen, so it's not totally occlusive. The vein is dilated and somewhat distended, consistent with acute thrombosis. And then we have our last component and the one weighted most heavily, the spectral Doppler waveform. And you can see that this is a dampened waveform. The other side is completely normal. So this meets the parameters and is very highly accurate for the diagnosis of central vein thrombosis when all three parameters are a match. But you can use compression in certain vessels and it should be employed when possible. Use color Doppler, but it does need to be optimized. If you do not optimize your color, you risk getting color overwrite of soft echoes, which could be consistent with intraluminal thrombus. If you can't compress certain segments, you can use the sniff test. The sniff test is just a minor method of being able to create pressure changes within the thoracic cavity and see if there is a response to that in the veins, just like using Valsalvo in the lower extremities. So as the patient takes a brief sniff on inspiration, you will actually see the size of the vein get smaller, and then you have a brief augmentation of flow. This would be normal response to the sniff test, indicating that there is no obstruction anywhere from where you're sampling to the more central portion um, of the vein. You should explain the procedure to the patient so they can assist you and make sure that they take a significant sniff in order to create enough of a pressure change. Always compare spectral waveforms side to side. So if we look at the sniff test, you can see the augmented flow upon inspiration, and then upon release, we go back to the normal pulsatile signal. But in this particular case, we have a normal limb, and then we have a dampened waveform on the contralateral side. This would indicate that this would be the arm that we would look for central vein thrombosis. So compression when possible, not only assessing for Doppler changes that occur during the sniff test, but also assess for vessel wall motion. A vessel that is patent and close to the heart, you'll actually be able to see the vessel wall motion during the changes in the cardiac cycle and respiration. Always assess for flow direction. Here's the optimized color, allowing us to see the residual lumen, and at the same time, allowing us to see the grayscales associated with the thrombus. Here's the compression used for the IJ. We have the CCA in a transverse view and compression of the IJ. Here's the IJ, not compressed, extrinsic compression. Flow direction. Color is a great method to quickly identify if flow is normally directed. Here we have the CCA going up towards the head 
and the internal jugular vein going the opposite direction. This is a very quick method to identify correct flow direction within the internal jugular vein. Ultrasonic windows include supraclavicular, infraclavicular, and it's always helpful when you find an abnormality to confirm these findings from multiple views. Due to the numerous artifacts that can occur from bone and pleura, it is important to make sure that you're not calling an exam positive for an artifact. Here you can actually see the confluence coming from this approach down into the anominate from the subclavian. So three phases to this study. There's the image component, the color Doppler, and the spectral Doppler. Unlike the lower extremity, that's what's weighted more heavily. Here we have our image, and in a longitudinal view, you can see the outline of this thrombus. The edges are very smooth. The vein is slightly distended, and this is very consistent with an acute deep vein thrombosis. We come here from another view, and you can actually, again, see how dilated this vein is. The walls are actually being pushed out a little bit, again, consistent with acute venous thrombosis. Here we have the IJ, completely normal in a transverse view. Color is optimized nicely. And here we have our normal spectral Doppler, where you're seeing the pulsatility associated with the close proximity to the right atrium. Now, a normal study, as we move out to the subclavian and then axillary vein, you can see here the clavicle. This is medial, this is lateral. Color nicely outlines wall-to-wall -wall a very widely patent subclavian and axillary vein. When we move a little more central, you can actually see we go from the subclavian down into the anominate vein. You'll see the change in the depth of vessel. Here's the associated Doppler waveforms. Again, very pulsatile and phasic. This phasicity is also consistent with a normal exam. Here's pulsatility coming from a little bit different angle from a more central portion of the subclavian vein. Now, these waveforms are both normal in spite of the fact that to the native eye, they might appear to be somewhat different, but they have all the components of a normal waveform. Abnormal Doppler waveforms are consistent with a loss of the pulsatile variation. And you might actually still have phasicity, but the pulsatility would be dampened. Continuous signal, absent, reversed flow, asymmetrical signals, or a stenotic jet. And this is not uncommon to have stenoses develop from the scarring that occurs from having the central venous catheter. Now, the accuracy improves when all three components correlate. Here in the image, we can see the subclavian thrombus, grayscale echoes, very, very dilated vein, actually pushing out a little bit here, consistent with an acute process. Here we can show the residual lumen in color. And then we come over and verify the waveforms. The waveform at the site of the thrombus is dampened. When we go to the contralateral segment of the same subclavian vein, we find a normal phasic pulsatile waveform. Here's the correlating venogram. This is a patient with Paget Schroeder's, and this you can actually see the thrombus extends into the cephalic vein. Now, other components consistent with an abnormal study beyond the spectral Doppler any segments that might be incompressible, the presence of intraluminal echoes, vessel size, wall motion, color filling defects. Now spectral Doppler, if it's abnormal but the image is not adequate to identify the pathology, then you must include this in the report that the Doppler signal is abnormal, however the etiology is not clear. Subclavian and anominate thrombus, this is not an unusual location for a patient with a central vein catheter. As we're coming from the peripheral portion of the subclavian, we see the thrombus moving centrally down into the anominate. So we have the positive Doppler signal, positive image. Here's a patient where we can see the cephalic vein, subclavian vein, and this is actually a collateral vessel. If we go out here, we have more collateral vessels. They don't show up very well in this image. 
But this is all we could get. This patient had an extremely swollen arm and chest, actually that extended up into the neck. But based on this finding alone, because of the severe venous hypertension, this patient went on for venography to determine treatment. Here is the axillary vein. Only a small segment of the vein was visible with very, very abnormal flow. And then upon venogram, we see that this is completely occluded. Here's all the collateralization taking effect. This patient had a proximal arterial venous fistula causing increased pressure and therefore visualization of all these collaterals. This is why the scan was extremely difficult because these vessels had no flow and were essentially absent. They treated the patient with lytic therapy, trying to open up the vein, and upon the first scan post-treatment, you can see we did restore flow. Color shows a little bit of the residual lumen, but this is a good example of someone with chronic scarring because we have sort of irregular walls here. You can see the size of the vein, it's not distended, and this is causing a continuous flow signal. Now, for an included anominate vein, the classic presentation or the classic finding would be reversed flow in the internal jugular vein. So if that one is suspecting an occluded anominate vein, it's best to go right to the IJ, put your transducer down low in the neck, look at the common carotid, the associated IJ, and quickly one can notice that they are both flowing in the same direction going towards the head. Now if we examine the remaining central vessels, what we see is here's the subclavian vein. Subclavian flow is directed towards the anominate. When it gets here, it hits the occluded anominate and it starts to reverse up into the internal jugular vein. Even if you don't get this image here, the finding alone of the reversed flow in the internal jugular vein is consistent with anominate vein obstruction. And here we can see the correlating venogram. Now, findings for an acute thrombus, free floating. It actually expands or causes distension of the vein. The walls are smooth and it appears to be like jello where it's actually somewhat deformable. For chronic changes or scarring of the vein, the size is going to get smaller. It's going to, the thrombus will actually retract or the scarring. It becomes very firm. The borders are irregular. You might actually see synechii, which is just sort of threading that occurs throughout the vein from the old scar, and or you might develop a stenosis. Here is the image of the chronic one that we looked at earlier, again just showing the irregularity, the retraction, and if we compare it to a more acute process, the vein size is relatively small. Now here we see a totally occlusive thrombus. We see it's free floating. The edges or the tail of the thrombus are smooth. And if you could see this in real time, you'd be able to appreciate the, how easy it is to deform in the movement of the actual thrombus. That's consistent with an acute thrombus. Here we have a small little chronic nub along the wall. And this is from a patient who had a long-term indwelling catheter in the subclavian vein. This particular patient, we have old, here's sort of the synechii. You can see along the wall, that's the old thrombus. But when we look at the size of the vein, it's somewhat distended and you can't really appreciate the soft echoes here, but that's actually pushing the walls out. So this is a patient who has new acute thrombus overlying an old event. This is not always readily that easy to identify. Catheters. As we know, catheters tend to be the culprit, and often you need to assess a patient with the catheter in place. Now, all the catheters will develop sort of a fibrin sleeve or sheath, and one needs to know when we advanced from the sheath to actual thrombus. Here we can see the catheter, which is a specular reflector. So depending upon how your ultrasound beam hits the catheter, you may see it in some views and not in others. This is a normal catheter. You can start to see some sheathing here. 
and you can see though that flow is essentially normal around the catheter and the lumen of the vessel is completely free of thrombus. As we move to another view of a different catheter, here we have the triple lumen catheter sitting out in the center of the vein. Here we have the thrombus that's actually attaching the catheter to the wall. This catheter remained functional and this was actually unchanged during the patient's stay. Here we're looking at the same catheter, but you can see the color nicely identifies the patent lumen. We come from another catheter and this one is actually causing a problem because you can see the distended vein, all the soft echoes. This thrombus has totally occluded the vein, pushed the catheter up against the wall, so the catheter is currently not working. This catheter had to be removed. Now, upper extremity venous duplex can also identify venous stenoses. The most common site is the confluence of the IJ and the subclavian vein. The focal increase in the velocity comes from the narrowing of the vein caused by the actual scarring. Now this image is not a very good image because this is low, it's coming just from the most central portion of the subclavian vein around the curve down into the anominate on the right side. And we're getting a lot of color overwrite and flash simply because the velocities were so high at the site of the stenosis. This is very focal, so you need to walk your sample volume around through the area or open it up so that you can actually identify the stenosis, which is reflected here in the high velocity below. This is actually the dampened signal, so when you're not actually in the stenosis, you can see that it's causing very, very diminished flow everywhere else. Here's a stenosis that's actually caused by probe pressure of the IJ. It's very important to not mistake this for a stenosis. Now, a heavy hand usually doesn't matter for most of the vessels um, when, when we're talking about the central veins, but it does play a role when we're looking at the IJ and sometimes depending upon a patient's size out towards the axillary vein. The artifacts that you might encounter occurring from bone, pleura, and lung Mirroring, here we have an image where we have a mirrored artifact. We have reverberation, comet tail effects. Here we can see the rouleau and noise. You wanna check your power levels. You also wanna make sure to minimize some of these artifacts to come from a different approach. And by changing your insonation of the ultrasound beam to the vessel, you might actually be able to work around the artifact. Now, if the artifact is continually there, and no matter which approach you use, you can see the artifact, it's important to note that if you had thrombus, the location of the thrombus won't move, while with an artifact coming from different views, it might actually appear to have moved. And this is just sort of a little method of being able to identify artifact from thrombus. What are the pitfalls to upper extremity venous duplex scanning? The limitation of ultrasonic windows, not all vessel segments can be completely visualized, the presence of numerous collateral vessels, short segment occlusions can be missed, especially if they occur like under the clavicle. Thrombus aging is difficult, but that's generally due to the poor image quality. The anominate vein, being able to identify mural thrombus, that's just due to the location and it can often be out of our field of view. You must have the appropriate transducer trying to scan the central veins using a linear transducer will not provide optimum results, and limited compressibility of the vessel segments. In summary, it's not as accurate as lower extremity venous duplex scanning. However, with the use of multiple parameters to diagnose thrombus, you can accurately identify the absence or presence of central vein thromboses or occlusions. It is a challenging an exam, and in order to produce good results, you need an experienced examiner and always obtain correlative studies so you know if the scans you're doing and interpretations are correct.